So have you ever had a lens that you thought was the widest lens you would ever need and then you saw another lens that was even wider? Well, this is that lens right here. This is the Irix 11 millimeter F4 and it's actually a really cool lens and it comes in this, this kind of neat aluminum tin. So let's crack this thing open and see what it's all about. First of all, the uh, fit and finish in the presentation is absolutely top notch. You get this nice, neat little hard faced little carrying pouch that's made out of like a suede material. And then you've got the lens itself, which has got a massive, massive front element. So let's crack this thing open and take a look at it. First of all, it's got a really cool look to it here with all of the, uh, all of the focus markings and everything. It's got a really cool aesthetic to it. It's a very, very nice looking lens. And this is actually a Canon mount. So you need an adapter to hook it up to a Sony camera, which is what we're gonna be doing. And uh, there's a few caveats to that that we'll get to in a minute. Now looking at the front side here, there's this gigantic front element that bulges outwards, which keeps you from putting on screw filter threads. You have to use the little slot at the back on the Canon mount that allows you to put custom uh, gel filters in there if you want to use a filter on this lens. This is actually their Firefly version of the lens, which has got, it's made completely out of plastic. They've got a Blackstone version, I believe, which uh, is made completely out of aluminum. The Firefly will run you $4.99. The Blackstone will run you a little bit more at $6.49. So is the extra $150 worth it to you to get a little bit of extra build quality, that's your call. It's completely manual focus, which is why it's got all these markings on it because uh, you need to know where you focus. And they are accurate if you're using a nice adapter or straight onto a Canon body. It's got a lock here so you can lock in the focus. So if you're shooting astrophotography, you can set it to infinity, lock that ring in, and then you know that no matter how much you fiddle with your camera, you won't lose that infinity focus and you won't have to try and refocus in the dark or zoom in uh, with your digital zoom on your camera. I found that focusing with this lens is a huge challenge because it's so wide that all of all your subjects are so small in it that even when you zoom in to 11 times to try and nail your focus on Sony cameras, if you're familiar with them, uh, you still almost can't even see what you're trying to focus on. So in those situations, that's where the uh, the accurate distance markers comes in handy. So now onto the particular things with the adapter that you use to get this onto a Sony body. The tricky thing with this lens is that you cannot control the aperture on the lens. You can only control it with the camera body itself. So you have to have a smart adapter. But I ended up making a mistake and that was using this cheaper Comlight uh, EF to E mount adapter here. And it is a smart adapter, so it does communicate all the, uh, all the aperture information and exposure information correctly, but you'll run into this problem with a lot of adapters with ultra wide angle lenses is that the edges and the corners are terribly soft, chromatic aberration everywhere. And that's what I ended up finding when I used this adapter on it. When I used the Sigma MC11 adapter, which is a little bit more expensive, about twice the price of this one actually, and a little bit better quality all around. It talks to the camera better and it does improve the image quality. So if you do use this on a Sony camera, you wanna make sure you've got a nice adapter. And if you're using a dumb adapter, you won't have any aperture control. So it will stay locked in at F16, which you don't want. So locking this into the adapter, it goes in there pretty nice and easy. And now let's throw it onto a camera body. So you can see this behemoth on the camera. So this lens is incredibly heavy. It's quite large given that it is just a prime wide angle lens. But uh, if you want the ultra ultra wide, which this 11 millimeter lens will give you, you're gonna have to sacrifice a little bit of the convenience factor because this thing is a beast. Here is it next to the Sigma 16 millimeter F1.4. And here's another example of it next to the 10 to 18 millimeter APS-C lens. And as you can see, there's a gigantic difference, especially in the diameter of the lenses. All right, well, let's go play with this thing and see how the image quality is. Okay, so this is kind of the view you can expect with vlogging with this lens. Uh, I don't recommend vlogging with it for a couple of reasons. One, it is extremely heavy, so this will wear out your arm in a heartbeat. 
and it's almost too wide. I have not looked at the footage yet, but I bet you can see my arm like up to here. And being able to see this much of the scene is really kind of unnecessary. It's just not a good idea. The 10 to 18 would be a much better choice, even if you have to jump down to APS-C mode, because oh my gosh, my shoulder is killing me. Okay, so now let's check out some baseline chromatic aberration and sharpness tests, and then I'll also show you guys some other pictures that I've been taking with this lens while I've been reviewing it. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the baseline photos here. I was kind of surprised when I first looked through these as there didn't seem to be much of a difference when stopping down from aperture to aperture. So I shot uh, f4, f5.6, f8, and f11. So let's jump into those pictures and see how they look. So we got the f4 on the left and the f5.6 on the right jumping in the center here. You can see that both of them are reasonably sharp. Now we're zoomed in at 2 to 1 here, so this is right up on it. And both of them are reasonably sharp. You certainly wouldn't say that the f5.6 is so much better than the f4. Uh, so there's not really a huge advantage to losing that stop of light there. So let's go ahead and move over to the corner here into these trees, which is where things get a little dicey. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about there. Look at all the fringing and the chromatic aberration. We got magenta and blue everywhere, and it's just awful. Here's where you notice a little bit of a sharpness increase here is, uh, is all the way in these edges here. But who's using that part of their picture to frame their subject with a lens this wide? Nobody. If you're doing it, stop it. That's gross. And so moving over to the other side, you see the exact same thing. It's rough, but when we stop down to F11, you can see that it pretty much stays the exact same. So you can see that there's pretty much zero chromatic aberration improvement going from F4 all the way down to F11. There's some sharpness increase here in the far corners. We already talked about that. But in the dead center, still between F4 and F11, it's almost completely indistinguishable as far as sharpness goes. There's no chromatic aberration in the center, but that's pretty much just true for the very center of the image. Even going a little bit off center here, we're going to go right into these trees here. You can see that we're getting some pretty harsh blue fringing, which hangs out all the way up to F11 as well. So what does this mean for actual pictures that you take? Well, I didn't really see it rear its ugly head many times. As you can see, zooming into the building all the way, we're still two to one. Uh, in the bricks, in the railing, all the non-super contrasty places, it's pretty much fine. But as soon as you get a black to white situation, that uh, chromatic aberration really jumps out at you there. You can see some magenta on these tree limbs here and some blue kind of areas in these here. So in general, it wasn't that big of a deal. This lens is very reasonably sharp. I didn't have any complaints with the photos I got out of it. And even the close focus, uh, you get very, very sharp images when you're focused really close at the minimum focus distance, which is, according to the dial here, is only about one foot. So that's as close as you can get, which is about, about like that there. And uh, you can still get plenty of stuff in the frame at one foot away. And uh, here's another example of the sharpness that you get at minimum focus. So with this picture here, you can see that it kind of falls away to a nice creamy bouquet in the background. But it's not necessarily as creamy when you are have got a sharp point of light. So let's take a look at this one here. You can see how crazy this uh, the bouquet gets there on the edges. And if you zoom in, you can see that it's quite grainy and garbly looking and just not very smooth, which that's not why you buy a lens like this is to worry about the background blur. But this is what it looks like anyway. Here's just a couple more images showing you how nice and sharp this lens is. This was at f4 as well. This clock is, I'm standing at the base of this clock. It's in focus. The building behind it that's 150 yards behind it, still in focus. Everything's in focus with this lens until you get within just a couple of feet. All these images that you see that have been edited, have been color corrected. I don't think that any sharpening has been applied other than just the default sharpening, no noise reduction, no chromatic aberration has been applied, nothing like that, just basic color correction and uh, just a little bit of straightening here and there. So what about the distortion on this lens? This lens, they advertise this lens as a zero distortion or a close to zero distortion lens uh, for $500, which is a pretty good price for advertising for that. But as you can see, there's still a little bit of distortion here. You can see the top brick here kind of curve back and forth. Same with the bottom line of bricks there. But this was 
I think this was at minimum focus. So this is a very challenging situation for a lens like this, for any lens being at minimum focus and expecting zero distortion, especially at this wide of an angle. So let's take a look at something a little bit more forgiving. So this was kind of an architectural opening here. You can see how big the doors are. This was a this is a big wall. And all the lines look pretty close to straight. There's still some bowing here on the far edges, but it's not that bad and certainly correctable, especially with uh, just a little bit of manual distortion correction. We can take this in and we're good to go. Again, here's a picture showing its sharpness. I was pretty much as close as I could get to this thing. I was just a couple inches away from the brick here on the edge. You can see just a little bit of that distortion creeping in on the sides and zooming in, you can see that it is very, very nice and sharp. And in this picture, it even controls that chromatic aberration pretty well. Vignetting, jumping back and forth between two images here. This is F4, this is F8. It does improve stopping down to F8, but it's really not that bad to begin with at F4. Here's a picture shot at minimum focus. And uh, as you can see, this is, I'm actually in this flower pot here. It's not a very big flower pot, but I'm inside of it and catching minimum focus right here at this flower about a foot away. And you can see that kind of grainy bouquet in the background as well. So the real question is, what do you use a lens this wide for? Well, I don't really have personal use for a lens this wide. So it was really challenging trying to go out and find stuff to shoot to, to test this lens out. I know that having a lens this wide and with this little distortion can be very useful when shooting real estate or other architecture. And I know that uh, Make Art Now, which is a channel here on YouTube, he shoots phenomenal stuff. He actually uses this exact lens for doing all of his or a lot of his interior real estate shots. And they turn out phenomenal. It keeps the distortion in check. Uh, all the lines look nice and straight and it takes absolutely beautiful photographs indoors, gets all the room and uh, makes the space look a hundred times bigger than it actually is. So if you're shooting real estate photography and you need something a little bit wider, this is certainly a lot of bit wider and will get the job done for you. But I do know that uh, lenses even as narrow as 15 millimeters can give you similar effects and do just as good of a job, but this one really takes it to the next level. As far as sharpness goes, it was plenty sharp enough. I didn't have any complaints about that. The chromatic aberration was a little crazy and you're certainly gonna get some artifacts even when using Lightroom's tool to remove those chromatic aberrations. There's so much there that it will leave some artifacts. But again, that was on the outside of your image, so I wasn't running into any problems. The images you get from this thing are certainly social media worthy, and the chromatic aberration wasn't that bad unless you had direct white to black contrast. So would I buy this lens? If, if I did lots of real estate, I would definitely buy this lens, but I don't, so I don't know if I, I don't think I would. I don't think I would have a use for a lens this wide, especially this big and bulky. I don't think I would take this on trips with me because it's just not very travel friendly given its size and weight. And let's see what the weight is real quick, just so you guys have that. It weighs almost two full pounds. This little lens, this relatively small lens weighs almost two full pounds. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's definitely part of the reason that this lens is not very travel friendly and will certainly give your arm a good workout if you're trying to vlog with it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this review. If you guys are interested in this lens, let me know what you guys are planning on shooting with it down in the comments because I'm generally curious as to what everybody else would be using a lens like this for. Is F4 fast enough for astrophotography? Maybe it is. Should I get out and shoot some astrophotography with it? Maybe I should. Maybe that'll be in the next video. So go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss that. Leave a thumbs up if you haven't already, and I will see you guys in the next video.